Okay, subject, verb, object, or I'm subtitling this video, How the NIV Published Fake News About God, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. So English is made up of clauses, and a clause in English is simply a unit of grammar, and the most basic unit of grammar in English is a subject, a verb and an object and it's really important to understand and to find the subject and the object in English. So for example, so for example, I desire chocolate. It's pretty simple. I and the subject to desire is the verb and the object is chocolate. So the subject is the person or thing doing the action or doing the verb. And the object is the person or thing having something done to them. Okay, so I'm the one desiring, I'm the subject, and the chocolate is the object of my desire. Subject, verb, object. And this is the, one of the most basic units of grammar in English you can have. All English needs a verb, okay? So the verb is the heart of this particular clause or any particular clause. The verb is the heart of the language. And then the subject is the one doing the verb, the object is the one having the verb done. So the object, chocolate is the object of my desire. My dog loves walkies in the park. <laughs> I'm waiting for my dog to come bouncing now. She hasn't heard that. Okay, so the subject is my dog. Loves is the verb, and of course, walkies in the park. Still waiting, I think she's sleeping. Walkies in the park is the object of her love, okay? Quite simple, a bit more complicated, but still the same basic elements subject, verb, object. Okay, these are the these are pronouns, personal pronouns. Are you, he, she, and it? They're all singular. And we, you, and they are all plural. And these are called subject pronouns. Okay. And these would be the corresponding object pronouns. So you've got the subject pronouns here and the object pronouns here. So if we take a Bible verse for example, let me just find something. Okay. In first John chapter four verse nineteen, we love him because he first loved us. Okay, so 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him. Let's connect these up. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 is made up of two clauses, okay? And a clause is just a unit of grammar. We love him is a unit of grammar. It's got a subject, a verb, and an object. Subject is we, and the subject pronouns. The verb is to love, and the object is him. And the thing to understand about this is the subject is always the active element. It's the subject that's doing the verb. So the subject is the active element, and the object is a passive element. Okay, the subject is doing the verb, we love 
him and the object him is the one being loved he's passive in the second clause in the verse because he first loved us so you've got exactly the same elements going on you've got the subject he God the verb to love and the object us this is past tense here of course okay and you've got the word because which is linking the two clauses together to make a, a phrase or a state uh, sentence okay we love him because he first loved us and the reason it's important to identify the subject and the object in any particular clause or phrase is because it will give us a better understanding of which is the active and passive elements in any particular um, literature whether it's the Bible or something else and this is what Satan likes to do Satan has always tried to do a switch to try and create a confusion switching the subject and the object it's really important to understand this and it's very subtle but Satan will do this through the media politicians and even the modern Bible versions Satan will do a, a very subtle little switch which I'm going to show you now how this affects Bible how it affects doctrine how it affects our understanding of the world around us because if Satan can do these little switches he will do and we see it all the time in the media where um, some kind of story can be reported on whether it's a political or a whatever it is it can be a, a, something on a criminal case or anything and the media can manipulate your thinking by switching the active and the passive elements okay so we're going to go over to the bible now we're going to have a look at genesis chapter 6 verses 5 and 6 and i'll show you exactly what's going on with this before we go to genesis 6 i just want to bring to reference John 11:35 here this very very short shortest verse in the bible Jesus wept and i just want to examine this grammatically before we move on Jesus is the subject because he's doing the weeping wept is the verb but we could say where's the object because English is an SVO language subject verb object pretty much all English is based on subject verb object but it's not a grammatical rule to include the object here as long as this phrase has the verb it conforms to English grammar so even these two words can be they're both a clause a unit of English grammar and a complete sentence hence the full stop so English conforms to this pattern of subject verb object but we have a lot of liberty within the language the grammatical rules the alphabet and other factors do have rules they do conform to certain patterns but we also know that God loves poetry you only have to read the Psalms to understand that God loves poetry so he gives us license in the language to be poetical to be creative to be expressive but there is an object to Jesus weeping you'll see the following verse says 
Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. This is, of course, John 11. It's about Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus. So is Lazarus the object of Jesus weeping? Well, if we go back up a few verses, we get the context here. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. So is the, is the object of Jesus weeping the dead Lazarus? Or is it as inferred in verse 33, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews also weeping with, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Well, Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus. The object of his weeping is not the dead Lazarus. The object of his weeping is the sorrow of Mary and the other Jews that came with her. And we can see this revealed in Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy of the coming of Christ. And if we look at verses 3 and 4, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, that have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And in the context of this passage in John 11, he is weeping for the sorrow and trouble of Mary and her Jewish friends, showing how Jesus was fully man. We know he's also fully God, but he's not operating in this instant as God above and beyond the human emotion. He's operating on this very level as a man expressing fully and sharing in this sorrow, a deep sorrow and emotion that Mary and the other Jews are expressing over Lazarus. So Jesus wept, getting back to the <laughs> grammatical point here, Jesus wept, Jesus the subject, to weep is the verb and the object of his weeping is expressed in these verses. So the context is all important because the object of his weeping is not contained in this sentence, but there always will be an object to the verb. The verb will have a subject and an object. So the object is contained in the context here. Okay, so we're going to go over to Genesis uh, chapter 6 and look at verses 5 and 6. So Genesis 6, I'll just read verses 5 and 6 in the KJV. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is, of course, just before the flood, 
or in fact just before God instructs Noah to build the ark before the flood okay and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart so what you're going to see in verse 6 Genesis 6 6 here is you're going to see three examples of subject verb object okay it repented the Lord so if you remember from earlier it is a subject pronoun I you he she it etc so you've got the subject pronoun the verb to repent and then the object is the Lord subject subject verb object there that he had made man on the earth again subject verb object and it grieved him at his heart and again subject verb object it repented the Lord he had made man it grieved him three examples in Genesis 6 6 of subject verb object short clauses short units of English grammar put together into a phrase into a sentence so we're going to break this down clause by clause to look at what's going on here so we know that it is the subject pronoun it has great significance in this verse in this clause and we also know because the ver because the verse starts with and it's a continuation continuation okay so we can look for it the context of what it is in the previous verses and you'll say see it here in verse 5 the it is the wickedness of man we know that it is the wickedness of man we can see it quite clearly in the scripture okay so it was the wickedness of man repented the Lord and we can argue that it's also the imagination of the thoughts of his heart and the evil continually as well okay you can argue that all of this is the it being referred to here in Genesis 6 6 so it repented the Lord so what what we need to understand here is that the subject is the active component of this phrase of this clause of English the it is the active the Lord is the passive element you have an active element which is the subject a passive element which is the object of the phrase or the object of the verb the next SVO clause in the verse he had made man on the earth okay well he had made man but really it's man on the earth we can include that because this is just an adjective that's describing on the earth is an adjective adjective phrase that's describing where man is okay so he which is the Lord it goes back to here that's the subject the subject of the clause there so now this part of the sentence is making the Lord the active part because it's he that made made is the verb had made it's just putting it in the past tense 
So he had made man on the earth. So here there's a complete turnaround from this clause to this clause. In the first clause, it's the wickedness of man that's the active element and the Lord is passive. In the next clause, the Lord, he, is the active element when, past tense, he made. So this is creation. It's going, this is going right back. So this is going right back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, when God created um, the earth and man on the earth on the sixth day. In that context, God, the Lord, he was the active element, man was the passive element in being created. Okay? But this is just a referral back to Genesis 1 and 2, the six days of creation, or seven days of creation, if you like. And then the final SVO clause is here. It grieved him at his heart. Okay, so again, you've got the subject pronoun it. The verb is to grieve. It's past tense here, of course. Uh, it grieved him, the Lord. Okay, so you've got a flip flop back again now. Whereas it, well, what is it? Again, it refers to these things here the wickedness of man, the imagination of his thoughts and the evil continually. That's the it being referred to here. The it, all these things, the wickedness of man, is the active subject element in this phrase. So it grieved, is the verb to grieve, it grieved him, the Lord. The Lord is passive in this. It grieved him at his heart. So you've got several things going on here. Now, this is, of course, Moses has written this down many, many, many years later. So, of course, this is all past tense. Because when we tell stories, we tend to tell stories in the past tense. Okay? Whether, whether they're factual histories or even in fiction... We write, when we write stories and tell stories, we're always telling them in the past tense. Okay, unless it's some kind of science fiction or something where we're referring to a future, whether it could be science fiction or prophecy or something like that. We refer to it in the future. But usually, generally, in English, when we're re relaying a story, relaying a history, we're talking in the past tense. You'll see the very first verb in Genesis 6, it came to pass, came, past tense. So that sets out the context that this is a history. Okay, so three things going on here, or two things going on here. So we have two times, we have two time frames in Genesis 6. We have this time frame just before the flood, just before God instructs Noah to build the ark in the time of, of the wickedness of man, which when, when it was great in the earth, which is in this clause here, the first and the third SVO clauses in Genesis 6. But we also have a different time frame here in this second SVO clause. And that's time frame is harking back to the creation of the earth and the sixth day when God created man on the earth. In the first and third clauses we have the Lord as the passive element and the wickedness of man is the active ele element. And it flips around when it, when it harks back to Genesis uh, the creation story. It, it flips back to when God was the active force in this clause when he made 
man on the earth on the sixth day. So this is a really important context to understand Genesis 6.6 6, or Genesis 6.5 and 6.6. 6. Now we're going to look at what the NIV does to these verses, okay? Because this is super important. Okay, so I've just copied and pasted from the NIV here, verses 5 and 6. Now, 5 isn't such a big problem. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Pretty much, pretty similar, or pretty much the same as the KJV. But here's the problem. And the problem is, Verse 6, because verse 6 is making God the active element here. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. In fact, this, this is a deeply troubling rendition of Genesis 6 6 this phrase here you see what they're doing they're putting these two clauses together so it's not even good English the Lord regretted that he okay in the KJV it says he it's repented the Lord so that's a complete flip-flop they're making God the active element of this clause but they're also pushing the other clause into it he had made human beings on the earth KJV says he had made man on the earth completely separate clause but here they're pushing the two clauses together they're doubling up on this he they're doubling up on on this um, pronoun, on the personal pronoun he. He had made human beings on the earth. The Lord regretted that he. Okay, so I'm going to add verse 7 in here actually as well to give more context to this it will explain it will explain it in, in greater detail um, but let me just show you what's happening in this the third clause here as well okay his heart was deeply troubled okay again his heart was there's the verb so you've got the subject and the verb there his heart was but it's making his heart the active element is making his heart the subject of this clause where clearly when we go back here to look at the KJV it the wickedness of man is the active subject of this clause his heart is the passive element it's subtle it's very subtle what's going on here but we know from genesis 3 that the serpent was the most subtle beast of the field or however it's expressed um, it's really it's really really subtle what's going on here but what they're saying what the NIV is saying is that the Lord made God made a mistake this is what the, this is what the modern version is doing here it's saying that God 
has made the mistake. Whereas the King James Version does not say that. Okay. It says it repented the Lord. It grieved him at his heart. There's an active and passive element in this throughout this verse. And the active element is the it, the wickedness of man, the imagination, thoughts of his heart, the evil, continually. But the NIV is doing something completely different to this. Let me just add verse 7 here for the full context. Okay, let's just render this in the KJV. You're going to see the same thing going on here in verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. This is the reason it repenteth me. Okay, there's an active and a passive element in this verse. But let's have a look at this in the NIV. The Lord said, I'll wipe, wipe them from the face of the earth, the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret. Subject, verb, I regret that I have made them. Okay, it's making God here. This is the reason for, because, for I regret. So the NIV is telling us that God is admitting making a mistake. It's fake news. This is absolutely fake news because it's not what the KJV says. The KJV shows clearly that it, 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 referring back, referring back, referring back to the wickedness of man. So God gave all of mankind um, free will, free will, a free choice. And it's the fact that man chose wickedness and evil. That's what's repenting the Lord. A rep repentance is always an action, a react, sorry, a reaction, yeah? Repentance is reaction. When you see the word repent in the Bible, it's a reaction. It will depend on the context, but it is, it's, it's a change of heart, a change of mind. It's turning away from. Yeah, Jesus says, unless we hate the world and hate our family and even hate our own lives, that we cannot follow him. So it's a reaction to the wickedness of the world around us. Our own part in that. And it's it's an, an understanding that we need God. That's what repentance is for us. But it's it's a reaction, okay? So there's a reaction here. The wickedness of man is the active element that causes this reaction, okay? But it's not what the NIV says. The NIV is telling you that God's admitting you made a mistake. This all plays into the hands of the atheists that claim that God was just just created, just um, committed genocide in Genesis chapter 6. But that's not what the KJV tells us. So I will leave that there. Hopefully I've explained that in a way that's understandable, that's edifying, and, and in a way that you can look at scripture uh, in more detail. It's really just a matter of studying how English works, because God put the scripture in our language for a reason. 
that we can understand it, but we have to understand the, gr the grammatical nuances of, of our own language, whatever your first language is for us. For anyone listening to this video, it will clearly be English, otherwise you'd be listening to this in a different language. But for English, English speakers, first language English speakers, the grammatical nuances are really, really important. So hopefully now, next time you look at scripture, pick up your Bible, have a look at some verses in the scripture. You can see what are active and passive elements. You have to look for the subject, the verb and the object. It's really, really important to examine those things in the scripture. And you can see how this little subtle twisting, this little turning around of subject and object is what Satan does. And also you'll be able to pick up these little nuances um, in media stories, in, in um, maybe in political stories or, or some current affairs, things that you might be interested in. You can see, you can see how the media, even with media that seems to be neutral, you can see little twists. It, it, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping this video will, will open, open the eyes to those who maybe aren't aware or haven't really thought quite deeply about these things, okay? So I'll leave that there. I hope this has been um, worthy of your time. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.